Hello everyone, the Mr. Miner here, and before I start today, I have a little explanation for the few of you that have been following the series. Um, so, it's been a while since the last one, about three weeks, and it's because I've been on vacation for those past three weeks, and normally I would be making as many as I can of these a lot faster, but I don't make videos during vacation, uh, well, for the most part. But, uh, anyway, welcome back to the Tin Tin series retrospective. Uh, by the way, I know how to pronounce Tin Tin. It's Teen Teen. It, uh, I know how to pronounce Teen Teen or Tin Tin. I call him Teen Teen because I just think it sounds cooler, but I know what it's really Tin Tin. So I might call him both, uh, throughout this retrospective. But anyway, uh, at the la uh, back to the last Teen Teen series retrospective. Uh, last time we looked at Teen Teen in the Land of the Soviets, and following that book's success in 1931, immediately after in the land of the Soviets, Hertz created Ten Ten in the Congo. Uh, before I get to addressing the book, I have to spend a while addressing the large amount of controversy over it. Uh, there are two main, so there are two main uh, pieces of controversy about this book, and uh, I'll address both of them and say if I agree or disagree. So the first claim was that this book is racist. Uh, it says that it depicts the people in the Congo as simple-minded, lazy, and sometimes, uh, stupid. It almost, like, displays them like they're acting like little kids. So, um, in my opinion, was Tintin Ten in the Congo racist? Uh, no. And I'll explain why. Uh, if it had been re released now, nowadays, like, if someone released this exact same book, undeniably it would be racist. It'd be, like, all over the news and people suing him, but, uh... You have to remember that at the time, no one had people hadn't really interacted or been able to see Congolese people. They only had stereotypes and rumors to go off of. Like there wasn't, there weren't any like TVs you could turn the channel on and they could watch people from the Congo going through their daily lives. So all they really had was stereotypes. So he was just Hirsch was just writing down that stereotype and expressing it in his book. So, uh, but if the same book had been published now, that would have been racist. Uh, another interesting thing to doubt about this is that there was a parody of Tintin in the Congo was made, which was making fun of it being, uh, quote-unquote racist. It was called Papa in Africa. Uh, I don't, I don't really know that much about it. I, like, saw a few pages of it, but, uh, it wasn't really that great, so I just kind of got bored and left. Uh, the second claim against the book was that it showed uh, a lot of am am animal cruelty and big game hunting. Uh, I can see where they're coming from on this claim a little more. Uh, because, like, some of the things... I'm just going to name a, whole bunch, uh, a lot of the things that Tintin does that probably the most controversial. He kills 15 antelope at one time. Basically, he's shooting at one antelope and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, die and he keeps shooting and shooting and they're like, oh... And so he's like, oh, you must have, you need more practice, Tintin. And then he finally kills it, and he comes to realize that he needed to use 15 shots to kill one antelope, because there were like 15 lined up. Uh, he catapults a stone at a buffalo. Uh, I mean, a, I, mean I said buffalo, but I meant buffalo. He catapults a stone at a buffalo. Uh, he kills an ape and wears its skin. Uh, he kills its, well, that's actually for a reason. He wants to, um... Disguised as an ape because another ape stole Snowy, so he kills kills an ape, takes its skin, and then goes up to get Snowy back. But uh, anyway, and the most infamous uh racist claim of all of this, of all of this entire book, and probably the entire Tintin series. I mean, not infamous racist claim, but the most controversy is he puts a stick of dynamite in a rhinoceros and blows it up. Um, that is just kind of over the top, and it's just kind of crazy, like, it's almost, it's just, like, putting a stick of dynamite in a rhinoceros and then lighting it. Uh, it's, yeah. But, uh, while I don't really find these things that offensive, because, again, he was just, uh, display, uh, he, big hunting was, like, Big game hunting in Africa was a normal thing going on in Africa. He was just, like, displaying that stereotype in his book again. Uh, and I'm not really that big of, like, a super animal rights person. Like, I am for, like, I'm not trying to say that I'm not for animal rights. I am. 
I'm just saying I don't find the book particularly offensive to me, personally. I think it was just depicting a stereotype, and I don't really have that big of a like a problem with it. Like, if those things actually happened, then I'd have a problem with it. But it's just a book, so people just really need to chill out about it. So, and he, Hirsch even later apologized for doing these things in the late, uh, during, in these things, do, during the 1930s. Uh, he, he said that he was, like, ashamed of it, and he was just displaying a stereotype, like I was saying. Uh, well, now when I'm done with that, I'm gonna get on to the actual, how I liked the book. Uh, this book definitely defined the Tintin character more, and it felt like a more refined version of Tintin in the Land of the Soviets. Uh, it did have its flaws, but I had a lot of fun, uh, watching Tintin battle criminals and explore the Congo. Uh, its best points are that Tintin... In the land of a Soviet, like Tintin in the land of a Soviet, Snowy gets a lot uh, more time in the book, and you know we have to see him talk and explore more often. And also in Tintin in the land of a Soviet, it was more uh, Snowy doing things with Tintin, and this one he has like his own little scenes. So I, I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. Again, that I think that's his best, its best point, like it was in Tintin in the land of a Soviets. Um, this book was also converted into color in the land of a Soviets. So, it's not really, like, a defining thing, because back then they were both in black and white, but looking at them, that, them now, it's definitely more appealing to look at uh, Tintin in the Congo. Um, anyway, we also get to see Thompson and Thompson, Thompson for the first time, but it's, uh, we do get to see Thompson and Thompson the first time, but it's only in one panel. We, uh, later in the Blue Lotus, we see them, or I think it's the Blue Lotus, we actually see them doing things and going around, but, uh... For now, we just see them saying, seems to be a young reporter going to Africa at the very start of the book. But it does introduce two new characters. <clears throat> it's like, these two mysterious figures, are they going to appear later in Tintin? <clears throat> okay, so, uh, if you are, uh, just because of the fact that they're, if you're, like, it's a little kid reading it, it it's going to look racist and cruel to, towards animals nowadays. It is, of course. There's no way you're not going to, like, notice that it's racist and cruel. So, uh, just because of those two things, if you are uh, a first to the Tintin series, I would recommend starting with the next book. But I do consider this to be the start of the Tintin character, as it defines him more as the character that we all love and know today. Uh, we're still not there yet, but we're going to continue our journey through the Tintin books, and we'll get to him. If you're not familiar with the rating system, you can check the description of this video right below. I'm going to give this one a low, can I have some more rating. Despite its flaws, it's a fun ride, and it transitioned to what I considered, consider to be the first real Tintin book. Uh, tune in next time, and we're going to look at Tintin in America. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Thanks for watching, and see you later.